So I'd like to um, welcome you all to um, this third day of the US Antarctic Science Meeting. And I'm gonna apologize for those of you who've been here for the previous two days, because I have to do a little bit of repetition um, in terms of just talking a little bit about the meeting and introducing myself. Um, my name is Deneb Kurenz. I'm a professor at the University of San Francisco, and I'm um, the US delegate to SCAR and I'm also the SCAR Vice President for Science. And we're very happy to have you here for the second US Antarctic Science Meeting. The first one was in 2001. And I wanted to make some acknowledgements. Um, the US SCAR um, office is supported by National Science Foundation, and that's through the Office of Polar Programs Antarctic Sciences section. And I, I really want to say how grateful we are to have that support. It has really meant a lot um, to us in terms of what we can do and, and how effective we are in representing the US in SCAR. And then I also wanted to mention that the Zoom today is provided by my university, which is the University of San Francisco. Um, so the panel today is gonna to be moderated by um, William Montin. Um, who is a senior advisor for Antarctica at the State Department. And Bill is also the lead person for the US delegation that goes to the Antarctic Treaty meetings. And then the, the three panelists are Jason Donovan, um, also from the State Department, um, Andrew Titmus from NSF Office of Polar Programs, and Jefferson Hinkey from the um, Antarctic Ecosystem Research Division of NOAA Fisheries. And so we will be hearing from them shortly. But before I turn this over to Bill, I wanted to take just a few minutes um, to talk about SCAR's involvement with policy um, and specifically with the Antarctic Treaty. So for those of you who are here on the first day, um, I had mentioned that SCAR has a twofold mission. Um, one is science leadership and the other one is providing scientific advice. So SCAR is an official observer to the Antarctic Treaty System, and the treaty system often requests specific information from SCAR, and there are times when SCAR feels that they could provide unsolicited information to the treaty system. And so SCAR attends the Antarctic Treaty consultative meetings every year. Um, we submit a variety of papers um, to that meeting, and we're there to provide scientific advice as needed. I'm gonna show you my really busy SCAR organizational chart again. Um, so this is the way SCAR is structured, um, but up here in the right-hand corner, we have the standing committee for the Antarctic Treaty System. And this is a group of um, 15 people that are responsible for essentially collating all of the information that comes out of all the other boxes um, in this figure. So as, these different groups are working on things that are related to policy that gets filtered through um, the standing committee um, scats. And we actually have two US members um, there, uh, Cassandra Brooks and George Waters. And unfortunately they were not able to attend today because they are attending a meeting in Chile on marine protected areas in the Antarctic and the Southern Ocean. So um, we do have um, that standing committee and connected to that is the Antarctic Environments Portal, which I'll talk about in the next slide. But I also wanted to point out that we have a scientific research um, program and ICON, which you heard about yesterday from the US SCAR reps. And this is a new initiative that is um, looking at ways in which we can be more effective in getting science into policy. The Antarctic Environments Portal is um, something that SCAR manages, and it contains a lot of information for policymakers. So if you're interested in the kinds of topics that um, the treaty is looking at or the kinds of things that we feel are important for policymakers to know, you can take a look at that website and get a sense um, of what's going on there. And with that, I'm going to turn the meeting over to, um, to Bill Montine and we will hear from him and the panelists. So Bill, the floor is yours. 
Great, then. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Karens, and thank you very much to everybody who has uh, taken time out of your busy day to join us for this particular panel. Again, this is um, a fabulous opportunity for myself as a representative of the policymaking world, uh, as a user of your and consumer of your information, to have this opportunity to talk directly with you. I'm very pleased that we have also um, a, a very distinguished panel here uh, that is going to be uh, joining us. And um, when it comes down to everyone's opportunity to speak, I'd like for you to give a few words about yourself at that time. So to model that behavior and then move on to a, a brief overview of what it is that we're talking about. Uh, my name is William or Bill Munteen. I'm with the US Department of State. I am a career diplomat. I've been uh, working diplomacy around the world for over 20 years now, the past five years or so. I've been the point person uh, for the development and implementation of policy of the United States towards Antarctica. And so that's been a great uh, activity here. Um, and to try to translate what I do into what you do and how best we can talk to each other. As you well know, data does not speak for itself. Each of you as scientists has conducted the long and difficult research to find the data and to make it speak to you. And then after you've learned what it's wrestled its truths out, uh, you've then published this information in peer review scientific journals, which the main readers are other scientists. So then the question comes, and this is what I'm hoping that we'll get to here is, what happens when you want that data that you've identified, that you've done the peer review, that's been talked about in the scientific circles, what happens when you want that data, that information to talk to policymakers? This is where this conversation um, is fabulous because I believe you need to know not only where your data is, and what it says, but where the policymakers are that are most interested in your information. So step back here, the United States, our policy towards Antarctica for the past decades has been to reserve the region for peace and science and to protect its environment using what we call the Antarctic Treaty System. So this Antarctic Treaty System is not surprisingly, a series of treaties and or agreements that countries active in Antarctica have developed in order to govern, for lack of a better term, Antarctica. So there's two main agreements. Um, one is the Antarctic Treaty and the other is called CAMELAR. And just in just a moment, we'll explain that as that, what that CAMELAR, that acronym means. But those two agreements Countries that are members to it meet once a year to address topics that fall underneath the competency of each agreement. So I've been the head of the US delegation to the Antarctic Treaty meetings for the past two years. And basically the Antarctic Treaty and its environmental protocol is the default. It covers the vast majority of activities and issues that might happen in the Antarctic region. So we have this other uh, agreement called CAMELAR. That's the Commission or Convention for the uh, uh, Conservation of Antarctic Marine Living Resources. So as the name implies, um, CAMELAR covers Antarctic Marine Living Resources, which um, translates into fish and krill. There's another person in my office. Her name is Lisa Phelps who has been the head of delegation for the United States to CAMELAR. So specifically, if you are researching Antarctic marine living resources and looking to share your information with their officials on that, well, um, that's the CAMELAR folks. And I'm not gonna go delve too much into that because we have Jefferson Hinkey here on this, uh, on this call that can do that much more in depth than I do. Well, then you've got folks like myself. Um, so non-living 
Antarctic uh, resources, so hydro um, or petroleum or whatnot, plus lots of things on the ground. That's what the Antarctic Treaty might be more interested in. And fortunately enough, we have Dr. Andrew Titmus here, who's of NSF, who will, who's also very familiar with the Antarctic Treaty meetings and can provide some more depth on these, uh, on that particular issue. But how do you get this information, your research to policymakers such as myself or uh, my colleagues? One route, well, you can publish it on this, the SCAR website. You can publish it through um, uh, the peer reviewed um, articles. Sometimes those will get to us. Another route is through science agencies, specifically National Science Foundation and NOAA. There are others as well. Um, they are both, they're all active in these treaty meetings and they are in contact with me and through with other government policymakers throughout the year. Another is through SCAR. So Dr. Krentz is on the US delegation to the Antarctic Treaty meeting and is in contact with me throughout the year. So that is one route to provide information into the government world. But SCAR also has its own independent voice. So it does not need to have its submissions, for example, to the Antarctic Treaty meeting to be vetted or approved by any national government. So this gives SCAR a very powerful position from which to amplify uh, particular uh, scientific achievements and research. Yet another way is through global entities such as the IPCC. So for example, of particular interest to Antarctic policymakers was the IPCC's special report on the oceans and cryosphere that was released in 2019. Now I'm gonna admit I'm a diplomat and I did not focus on science when I was at school and my teachers will very much attest to it and my grades prove it. So compilation reports such as the IPC cryosphere report or even SCAR's Antarctic climate change and the environment reports are great resources. These are great from my perspective since they reflect consensus viewpoints and really have the power that comes from multiple scientists and researchers providing input into a shared result. I do have to put a somber note on all of this. Policymakers are not scientists, I've already admitted that. And we also reflect our government policies and positions. And so we've seen this before, we'll see it again. There should be no real expectation that uh, scientists will, uh, the policymakers will necessarily immediately reflect or uh, fully reflect this consensus or the information provided by scientists. This will happen just because there's multiple uh, factors at play of which science is a very important role, but rarely is the sole role as to what's happening. I'm gonna cut my portion here at this stage here, and I'm going to turn it over uh, to my panel members here. If we could start off with Dr. Andrew Titmus, if you could uh, uh, lead us off here from your perspective as to from NSF OPP. Thank you very much. Yeah, sure, thanks, Bill. Um, so uh, I'm, I'm Andrew Titmus. Uh, I'm the environmental program manager uh, for the Office of Polar Programs at the National Science Foundation. Um, I, uh, my background is that I have a, a PhD in zoology. Uh, I was a seabird ecologist before uh, coming into government work. Um, my work always uh, focused on uh, applied management strategies uh, for remote areas. Uh, and I've been involved in Antarctic environmental policy uh, since uh, 2017. Uh, and like Bill said, I serve on the U.S. delegation to the Antarctic Treaty Consultative Meeting uh, and also uh, on the delegation to, uh, to the CAMLAR meetings as well. Um, my work is, is sort of split. Uh, I, I spend part of my time um, implementing uh, our Antarctic environmental policy within the U.S. Antarctic program. 
Um, and then I also spend time working on the uh, international issues uh, through the through the treaty uh, consultative meetings. Um, and when we're when we're at the Antarctic Treaty, um, NSF, myself, and and my my colleagues, we uh, lead the work uh, at the Committee for Environmental Protection, and this is the main advisory body to. Uh, to the Antarctic Treaty Consultative Meeting on environmental protection issues. Uh, so, uh, so this provides, this includes providing advice on protected area management, uh, the conservation of flora and fauna, uh, environmental impact assessment procedures, and uh, waste management issues amongst uh, other, other things. Uh, and, then, and then within the US Antarctic program, uh, we conduct environmental impact assessments for all of our science and operational activities. Um, we provide permits for activities within protected areas, for waste management, for take of native flora and fauna for research, uh, and, uh, and we work to reduce the environmental impact of the U.S. Antarctic program in line with the treaty requirements uh, U.S. law and the goals of of our program. So, uh, so the the committee for environmental protection, um, the the way that it works is is that every year uh, we have a meeting that goes on at the same time uh, as the Antarctic Treaty Consultative Meeting, and uh, we consider a number of topics, and they're all towards the goal of implementing uh, the. Uh, the goal of the environmental protocol, which is the comprehensive protection of the Antarctic environment and dependent and associated ecosystems. And so the CEP provides advice on the implementation of the uh, comprehensive protection of the Antarctic environment. The key here is that the protocol specifies that the ATCM should make decisions on the implementation of the protocol based on the best scientific and technical advice available. And so what we do uh, in the CEP is we look to the information and the recommendations provided by observers to the treaty as a basis for this best available science. And so one of the things that we're really interested in is, is reinforcing the fact that SCAR is the provider of that best available science. Um, so some of the things that the committee has been working on this year uh, includes things like implementation of a climate change response work plan. Uh, and based on uh, SCAR's work, uh, on their Antarctic Climate Change and the Environment Decadal Report, implementation of the recommendations to address climate change issues. Uh, we've worked on reviewing environmental impact assessment procedures, um, and we review a lot of management plans for Antarctic specially protected and managed areas, uh, and we designate new protected areas as necessary. Um, we address a lot of non-native species issues. Uh, this year, this is focused on the current threat to Antarctic wildlife from the introduction of highly pathogenic avian influenza. SCAR has provided advice on this and continues to provide advice as we learn more about this important topic. Um, and also uh, protection of uh, vulnerable species. Uh, so in the last few years, uh, the committee has been working on uh, attempting to uh, designate the emperor penguin as a specially protected species. Um, and we continue to point towards the, the best available science that has previously been presented uh, by SCAR, that the emperor penguin population is projected to decline significantly due to reductions in sea ice. Uh, and, uh, uh, and so those are some of the, the topics that, we, that we've worked on this last year and will continue to work on in, in years going forward. Um, I think what is maybe important to understand is, is how you can be involved and, and how you can help. 
And the first thing that I would say here is, is that you should engage with SCAR. Um, the requests from the treaty for information and advice from SCAR are growing, and we need consolidated, clear, and actionable information on which we can base decisions. Um, you should continue conducting great science. You already understand what the most pressing questions are about the Antarctic environment, and your work can feed into the reports that are produced by organizations like SCAR that we can then use as a basis for decision making within the treaty system. Uh, also, think about how the results of your science can best be used as a basis for management decisions. Uh, for instance, there was a call this year from the treaty that we want better tools that can translate science into rapid management actions. Um, and uh, your science provides the basis for many of the protected areas that we have within the treaty system. Uh, your science can also inform us about how well a protected area is meeting its goal. So timely and relevant research results that can feed into things like the review of the Ross Sea Marine Protected Area are also really important. Um, we can propose new protected areas based on a, a need to protect a unique scientific value. So if you work in an area that you believe would benefit from a specially protected area status, then you should let us know. Um, and then the last thing that I would say here is just to give a plug to some uh, various policy fellowships. So if you're interested in science policy, particularly if uh, you are a graduate student right now, then I'd really encourage you to look into programs like the Knauss Marine Policy Fellowship and the AAAS Science Technology Policy Fellowship. These are a great way to learn about how science policy works firsthand within the government. And you can build great skills that would be really useful to, to bring back into academic positions as well. Um, and uh, so I'll, I'll stop there. Great, thank you very much, Andrew. And um, I probably should have mentioned this earlier, but I'm sure Dr. Karens did. We want this to be an interactive thing. So um, please uh, save up your questions and we look forward to engagement uh, with everybody who wants to engage at the end of these, uh, these broad presentations. Uh, so at this stage, so let me get this over to Dr. Hinke of uh, NOAA, please go ahead. All right, thanks, Bill. Uh, hi, everyone. My name is Jefferson Hinke, and I work with the Antarctic Ecosystem Research Division. That's a part of NOAA Fisheries, and we're out in uh, La Jolla, California on the Scripps Institution of Oceanography campus, and that's actually where I got my PhD about 10 years ago now. And um, I have been active in the Camelar world, so as Bill mentioned, that is the uh, the, the part of the Antarctic Treaty System that deals with marine resource issues. And I've been actually doing that since even before I did my PhD back in 2005, when I first set foot on Antarctic, I got myself roped into some of those issues uh, within Camelar. And it's really been a, a major thread of, of my career as I've been going through this. Um, I do have a, a, a presentation. I'm gonna try to share that now. And uh, just to um, hopefully give some visuals to some of what I'd like to talk about. Um, I'll assume that you guys can see if I can get that full screen for you. There we are. Um, the Antarctic Ecosystem Research Division that, that I work for is kind of unique in many ways because we really do straddle the divide between science and policy where we're not only down in the field wearing our muck boots and getting quite dirty sometimes working in penguin colonies or with seals or other animals out at sea. Um, but then we exchange those muck boots for the, some more formal attire and actually sit at a table to represent um, United States US science to inform policy decisions about how resources can be managed in the Southern Ocean. And so um, I think someone had mentioned uh, George Waters, uh, and he's not here today. He's actually my boss, but he's pictured there sitting next to me um, behind our flag at a recent Camelar meeting, um, which was which are always held in Hobart. Um, that was last year. Um, I think probably that one of the things that is what I'd like to do today is to just introduce you to what Camelar is, what 
the Antarctic Ecosystem Research Division is and how we interface with the uh, with with Camelar. So how do we feed the science that we and others collect and promote into actual policy advice that's then adopted and hopefully used to manage resources in the Southern Ocean? Um, at the very beginning, Bill introduced Camelar, and he was correct. It is the Convention on the Conservation of Antarctic Marine Living Resources, and it's the remit of that particular part of the Antarctic Treaty is highlighted there in the map in the in sort of the yellowish green color. Um, it's a it's an enormous expanse of the Southern Ocean, um, which Camelar is in charge of, and Camelar is a community of now twenty seven different members around the world, and all the decisions that Camelar makes in respect of managing fisheries for things like krill, toothfish, ice fish, and also in establishing marine protected areas in the Southern Ocean is a consensus-based um, approach. And so that means that you need to have sufficient scientific understanding about all of these things to get all 27 members to agree that something needs to be done and something needs to be done in a particular way. And as you might imagine, that is um, not often an easy or efficient model, but when it does happen, then you can be certain that you've got um, a good background to, to proceed from. Now, when the US um, became a member of Camelar back in the early 1980s, um, Congress mandated through uh, the uh, Antarctic Marine Living Resources Act, I think it's called, um, uh, the establishment of a science program, a directed science program that's supplemental to um, the things like what NSF would be doing. Um, to provide scientific advice and do research to help promote U.S. policy interests in the Southern Ocean. And that program uh, eventually became the U.S. AMLR program. And today, if we fast forward from the 1980s now, the U.S. AMLR program really represents the core work of the Antarctic Ecosystem Research Division within NOAA Fisheries, who I work for. And our program really covers the breadth of taxa and breadth of habitats and environments that are in the Southern Ocean, particularly as it's related to the Antarctic Peninsula region. In the map there, you can see that white polygon, which represents sort of the spatial footprint of our core research area, as well as two red dots there identifying field camps where, uh, that's where I work actually, is one at Cape Sheriff and the other on Admiralty, in Admiralty Bay on King George Island, which we, which we like to call uh, Copacabana. Uh, but you can see we, you know, we do a lot of traditional, but also some more advanced technology type things as well. And so our goal then is to take all of these particular studies that we're doing. Some of them are long-term monitoring. Some of them are more custom to particular questions that we might have about the environment or about a particular species and its population dynamics or the threats that are associated with fishing on, on, on krill that might impact those organisms. And how do we actually interface with Camelar then to advise policy. And I think the first thing to do is just to briefly overview what how Camelar is structured. Um, in the two big orange boxes, the two main um, bodies of Camelar, one is the commission, those are the, the diplomats, the policymakers um, that have authority to negotiate on behalf of their member states. The interesting thing about the commission is that it is obliged to make its decisions based on what Andrew mentioned, which was the best available science. And that's where the scientific committee comes in. It's independent of the commission, but advises the commission on matters related to things like how much you should catch, where you should take it from, where MPAs ought to be located. And those decisions that the scientific committee reaches are all sort of assembled in its own working groups. And there's a, a whole host of working groups um, that we have specific terms of reference to deal with questions about stock assessments, about how you develop models, about ecosystem monitoring, bycatch, and other things. Um, and it's really at these lower levels of the working groups that our group, the AERD, Antarctic Ecosystem Research Division, really engages. And so, for example, I attend several of these meetings. WGEMM has to do with ecosystem monitoring. IMAF um, has to do with bycatch of, of typically of we're talking about seabirds and mammals in, in that particular uh, working group, but increasingly things like fish and other uh, uh, organisms being caught as bycatch as well are issues. And several of my colleagues also attend these meetings with their remit is more interested in um, fishery stock assessments, fisheries research, and those sorts of things. So we, we really engage there, but then we also go right directly to the scientific committee to sit there and help make decisions that then the commission is obliged to sit to. And we've been fortunate in the US that the, com uh, the, um, the commissioner, 
at the commission level and the scientific committee representative of the United States have always had a very close collaboration. And the policy has always been to drive the policy with the science. And so we've been very lucky in the US to be able to um, take advantage of this tight link between science and hopefully that informing policy. Very quickly, I just wanted to wrap up by saying, as a very specific example, um, one of the big issues before CAMELAR today is how is the krill fishery going to be managed moving on into the future? There's growing demand, more and more nations and vessels wanting to capture this resource um, for various reasons. And a lot of the work that AERD and the US AMLR program has done have actually been, in my opinion, very instrumental in shaping not only how things are currently managed, but also how they might be managed as we develop new ways going forward. And so just some very specific examples about how we've used um, ship surveys and gliders, uh, autonomous gliders, to come up with estimates of crow biomass. Uh, the more of the work that I do with is tracking um, penguins and monitoring nests and doing census and diet work and that kind of ecosystem monitoring and also statistical and simulation modeling um, are all used. And these are all the kinds of things that our program works on um, that have helped form uh, fisheries policy as it currently exists. And so with that, I'll just wrap up and say thanks and uh, pass it back to Bill and look forward to answering any questions that I can from you all about um, how CAMELAR and, and, and science are, are engaged. Thanks. Thank you very much, uh, Jefferson. And we may submit that last photo with the pictures of everyone's with the krill hats um, uh, for the caption that uh, photo for later on uh, during SCAR's activities here. Um, as you might guess, Antarctica um, has lots of international collaboration. It's not just the United States um, that is uh, conducting sci great scientific activities down there. All sorts of other countries are very, are very active in the region as well. With that as a bit of a transition, I'm going to uh, let my colleague Jason Donovan speak a little bit about not focus specifically on Antarctica, but how the State Department itself really engages on the scientific uh, realm here. So Jason, let me turn this on over to you, please. Thanks very much, Bill. Um, can you give me a quick thumbs up if you can hear me properly? Great, thank you very much. Um, and uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Krentz, to, for the invitation to, to join you today and to provide a little bit of the kind of big picture uh, kind of intersection between science and diplomacy. I thought that, um, that uh, Jefferson's uh, muck boots to three-piece suit uh, kind of uh, um, portrayal was, was, a, was a wonderful kind of granular um, depiction of kind of that, that one way in which that, that linkage is made. Um, but I wanted to zoom out a little bit uh, and give more of a Washington-centric uh, but also global perspective um, on, on the way that we do uh, science diplomacy. Um, when we talk about uh, science diplomacy, we talk about a kind of bi-directional relationship between those two things. Um, we talk about how we use scientific information to shape our policy making processes so that they're data informed and data driven, uh, but also about how we use diplomacy and the tools of diplomacy to um, make scientific research uh, more tractable and more, more, more fruitful. Um, in addition to advancing um, the shared goals of um, the United States and other partner countries. Um, one tool that we have at our disposal for doing this is called an STA or Science and Technology Agreement. Um, my office, which is the Office of Science and Technology Cooperation within the Bureau of Oceans and International Environment and Scientific Affairs at the State Department, has statutory responsibility for negotiating science and technology agreements. Um, and we do have nearly 60 active agreements uh, with countries around the world. Um, among these science and technology agreements or STAs, um, the United States has uh, STAs with 10 out of the 11 uh, signatories to the Antarctic Treaty. Um, the, the other one, Belgium, uh, we engage uh, under an STA, which we have with the European Union. Um, so it's not that we don't engage with, uh, with Belgium, but we do so within the broader framework of our US-EU uh, science and technology uh, agreement um, in that capacity. 
But basically what um, science and technology agreements permit is create a framework for scientific collaboration. And um, I'm very, very pleased to see both NSF and NOAA uh, as part of the panel um, because I've had the great pleasure of working with colleagues from NOAA and NSF uh, in, a in a number of different frame uh, contexts where we've, um, as the State Department, have pulled together um, colleagues from the science interagency uh, to travel overseas to meet with counterparts from other countries with whom they're working on specific science projects, be it on in the Antarctic or otherwise around the world. Um, and um, th that collaboration can, can span um, everything from fisheries uh, of the sort that uh, Jefferson mentioned um, to another um, form of um, uh, science, particle physics, which is also very important uh, for NSF in the Antarctic. Uh, they have, uh, I think, funded the uh, Ice Cube Neutrino Detector, uh, one of the most uh, sensitive detectors uh, on Earth um, uh, to detect neutrinos uh, in, 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 Antarct in the Antarctic. Um, so the, the scope of the science really runs from the bottom of the ocean to the heavens uh, and, and the deep, uh, deepest parts of the universe. Um, and um, I guess, I, guess I, I wanted to uh, take a minute to mention that the there is that kind of collaborative relationship between uh, we diplomats um, and uh, science diplomats, um, those scientists who are engaged in international collaboration uh, as part of their daily work, um, who recognize that the value uh, of sharing ideas in a um, trusted, open and transparent way with, with like-minded uh, researchers is deeply valuable to uh, solving some of the most challenging uh, uh, issues that we face globally, whether it's it's uh, it's um, uh, loss of of uh, species or climate uh, effects uh, more broadly, um, but it also includes things like plastic pollution, um, ways to um, uh, advance a, a more circular economy, uh, so as to to reduce the the, the creation of plastic pollutants, um, various kinds of mitigation and and um, uh, of, of pollution uh, and various other 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 global concerns. So um, I, I would just like to mention a couple of other programs that my office is involved in. Um, one is the uh, Science Envoys program. And this is a program that uh, we uh, organize within the State Department to highlight the work of private sector scientists who are leaders in their field. Um, whether it's on uh, deforestation or circular economy, as I mentioned, or the application of indigenous knowledge to uh, climate uh, studies, um, or um, in, in fisheries, or any any of a number of different areas, and um, these envoys are selected by the Secretary of State with the help of uh, my my uh, home bureau, um, and they are um, deployed uh, globally to elevate the importance of certain scientific topics in, in areas of interest. And um, it's, it's very much a, a flagship program uh, that we're, we're very proud of that elevates the, um, the role of science in addressing some of the most consequential issues we face globally. Um, I would also mention the Embassy Science Fellows Program. Um, this is a program that has existed for 22 years. Um, and what it does is it partners um, scientists who are um, in the US government um, across the science interagency that we call, um, whether uh, ir of many different science agencies, science focused agencies, um, and um, it, it pairs them and their expertise with uh, embassies across the world um, that have where uh, the host uh, nation has a particular interest in a technical or scientific challenge um, and want to take advantage of the expertise that US scientists can bring. So we try to facilitate those engagements over the period of some months where the scientists are able to either travel to the country and live in the country and work with the host na nation counterparts um, or to do so virtually or in a hybrid format to facilitate those exchanges. Um, and um, I would mention that uh, we in 2019 had an embassy science fellow in Chile uh, who was working on uh, Antarctic cooperation in that capacity. Um, and lastly, I would I would say for all of you who do science um, uh, and are involved in in international collaboration, 
that you are to think of yourself as also diplomats because you are representing the, some of the best of the United States uh, internationally um, and engaging regularly uh, in a global um, effort to, to elevate uh, uh, data-driven, fact-based, science-based solutions to very real problems. Um, and I know that one of my colleagues, uh, I, I, I think it was Andrew, you mentioned the AAAS, the American Academy for the Advancement of Sciences um, uh, Technology Policy Fellowship. Um, I happen to be married to a former AAAS fellow, and my office employs a number of them uh, currently. And so I, I think the world of, of AAAS fellows. Um, and I should mention also the National Academies of Science, uh, Engineering, and Medicine has the Jefferson Science Fellowship Program, uh, which is available to not for the Jefferson from, from NOAA, but broader uh, Jefferson uh, Fellowship Program, um, which is available to scientists at a more senior level who um, may be more uh, advanced in their career uh, to do um, assignments within uh, uh, different organizations outside of their home, home uh, organization. Um, lastly, I should mention that my office, the Office of Science and Technology Cooperation, has hosted uh, fellows in our office in the past and we are uh, very open to, to, to that as well. Um, so um, I, I would just finally add that, that we uh, typically uh, will engage with the academic community um, across a lot of different venues. Um, we, as I mentioned, work with the, the, the research funding agencies within the US government, but also interface with um, different universities who are promoting uh, different uh, scientific uh, engagement internationally as well as those uh, scientific associations that are promoting uh, more transparent and, um, and um, um, trans tr transparent norms for uh, research uh, and, and, uh, and uh, scientific integrity, as we call it. So um, with that, I'll, I'll, I'll close and, and just uh, welcome any questions you may have about the world of science diplomacy. Thank you. Great, and thank you very much, Jason, and again, um, uh, we turn this over to the crowd here. Your hand or type in a chat. Happy to uh, respond to any 